people of the universe, I'm Matt Micucci and this is Matt's Art Chat, my weekly series of podcast conversations about the arts with creators, curators, experts and art lovers from all over the world. People of the universe, I'm Matt Micucci, welcome to Matt's Art Chat. My guest today is Franco D, who, in addition to being an artist, is the owner of Balaban Art Gallery, Ireland's smallest art gallery, located in the heart of Dublin, just off Grafton Street. Big news, as the gallery has taken its business online in response to the coronavirus, so you can check out what's on offer. And to do that, you can visit balaban.net, that's B-A-L-L-A-B-A-N dot net. And if you want to Google photos of the place, I suggest you do. It's a place full of character. If you ever find yourself in Dublin, check it out. Have a look for yourself. But of course, Frank, being an artist himself, we also talk about his own work, influences, about his background in music and a lot of other things. It was absolutely great chatting with him, and I hope you will enjoy listening to the chat wherever in the world you may be. So my friends, in the words of the great Tom Snyder, adapted for oral purposes, fire up an audio teeny, sit back, relax, and listen to the audio waves as they fly through the air. Hey Frank, how are things in Dublin? Well, we're kind of all in expectation of um, opening up the country next week. We've been given government uh, uh, restrictions for the last five weeks. Uh, we're in a kind of a, a type of a lockdown now. There's different definitions of the of the word lockdown, but um, it means basically that uh, all non-essential businesses are closed and um, restrictions of travel within five kilometers and a few other things like that. So we're there's still we we had a lockdown last. April, which was a lot more stricter, but this is still to be a bit less with, with regard to restrictions. But we're all kind of an expectation of next week when the country reopens up again or goes back down to uh, level three, which would be less restrictions. Have you found that uh, the current situation has impacted your creativity? In a way, it has uh, impacted, but in a positive way. Um, I know a lot of people might think it can work negatively, but with creativity, I think a lot of my inspiration comes in the current environment, in what's happening in the world. And uh, I get some inspiration from what's happening. And particularly with this global pandemic, it has uh, reached out and affected everyone in the world. And uh, sometimes it can be an inspiration for for coming up with uh, creative pieces that you might not normally have thought about working on. When did you discover that you had a passion for the arts and that you'd like to pursue uh, your ambition to becoming an artist? Well, my, my passion for art didn't really uh, kind of uh, start until I was in my late 20s, uh, early 30s. Um, I did always love art and um, I was more into the, the music, um, particularly in my teenage years. Um, I, I played the piano and uh, guitar and a few other instruments, but... My, my passion was always for music and um, songwriting and all of that sort of world. Um, but with the, the art as in the painting and all of that, it was kind of with the leaving cert, uh, which would be the, uh, the old final years in secondary school. Uh, I used to love the art classes. It was my favorite subject in, in the school. And I think partly due to the the teacher we had who was very encouraging and about expressing ourselves through the art and it wasn't a strict kind of um, subject, you know, that you could let loose a bit more. And I, I just loved art from, from school. And uh, I think after the leaving certificate, then I, I kind of forgot about it for a while. And then I always loved and I still do love um, the whole thing of caricatures and cartoons and uh we used to get the newspapers and I used to cut out the little cartoons in the newspapers and then I'd be at home and I'd be copying them. And uh, just particularly some of the caricatures and I'd just get a pen or 
uh, a marker or whatever. And I just start copying them. And I used to love doing all that. And it, from there, I just kept on drawings and little cartoons and all those little cartoon strips. I used to love them all. And wh- why do you reckon that uh, you kind of stopped thinking about art uh, in that space between secondary school and, uh, as you said, your late 20s. This is also because a career in the arts is just a difficult one to even imagine to some extent. It is, Matt, yeah. I, I mean, even using the term career, my my parents are, are other people would have laughed at the idea of having a career in, uh, in the arts or as an artist. I was very much um, geared towards um, when I leave school, I'm going to end going to work in the bank and uh, I remember gosh must be about 10 or 9 or 10 years of age at the time and uh, I was asked by my parents or teachers what would I like to be when I grow up and I used to say I want to be a bank manager what not only work in the bank but to be a bank manager and I think it would have been obviously my, my, my father worked in the bank and I suppose I looked to him and I said I wanted to do what he's doing I hadn't a clue what banking was about or anything like that, but I just wanted to be a bank manager because my daddy seemed to like that job. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of geared towards um, in secondary school, I, I you know, was doing uh, uh, economics and accountancy and um, kind of those subjects that would be beneficial to me. Uh, and it was always a case of, yeah, no, I always want to work in a bank. And then, of course, in the Ireland of those days, I, the bank was a permanent pensionable job, just like the civil service, you know, and it's a job you, you enter into and you, you're there until you're, you're retired. So it was a lot of practical and I suppose you'd be influenced by your parents as well. It, they would be looking for a career in, in something a bit more stable rather than the arts. And even at the time, I didn't really have any uh, leanings towards uh, being in the art you know uh, if if anything i'd love to have been more involved in music um and I, I used to love i had a very big passion for i still do for for the music and the whole creative process songwriting and uh and all of that yeah oh you still play you still play music i i yes i still play in fact when i was in my 20s when i was working in the bank full time i continued on playing music but what i would do is i would play in restaurants and piano bars around dublin on a maybe on a friday or saturday evening and i used to love that um it was very much background music i i wasn't singing at all just you know you're playing beatles elton john whatever all that kind of um background music and yeah so it kept me um uh in the music side of things um and then i i used to used to do a lot of songwriting and I used to buy, uh, well, I had an old four track recorder, I used to record at home and then I had a, a great keyboard and uh, it was a Roland keyboard and then a kind of a, what do you call it, I think, to, to, to a 16 track kind of recording. So you had full backing tracks and myself and a friend of mine did a lot of uh, songwriting and um, it, it kind of, for me, uh, you know, it could be up till three or four o'clock in the morning. One of those things that you forget what time it is and writing and, and recording that whole creative process. So I think to, to answer that kind of question, Matt, how, how the, the, the painting and the art side didn't really, uh, I, I was putting my creativity more into the music side and I got a lot of satisfaction out of that. So the art, I didn't miss the art. I didn't really have that big thing there in the first place, but um, just the creativity of you creating something out of nothing, you know, like a, a song uh, and lyrics and music and putting it together. Music and painting and uh, all of the other art forms, they also uh, are somewhat generally influenced by a desire to for one to express uh, oneself. Do you feel that you are also driven by that desire to express yourself through the arts? Absolutely, yeah. It, it, it is something that most people who get into the arts they're doing it out of a, a, a very strong desire to express themselves, to a, 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 cre- a creativity that is inbuilt, you know, whether whether a person gets paid for it or not, or, or whatever, it, it, it's, you, you keep doing it, you know. I mean, if you talk to 
any artist today, um, particularly during the pandemic, when the whole country, the whole world went into lockdown, people didn't just say, ah, oh, that's it, I'm not going to do any art now, I'm do any painting or any music or whatever, uh, because, you know, I'm not going to get paid for it or whatever. There's very few people like that that will stop. You know, you do it because you love it, and you probably even more so now. You you be more creative because you know you just it's a need. It's it, I don't think people have a choice nearly to go as far as to say that people do it because it becomes part of like breathing or living and eating and walking. You know, it, it has to be done. So when you started painting again uh, as you said in your late 20s and so so on in those early years of just uh, you know really getting into it again uh, what do you what were the themes that interested you and that influenced you yeah I, I've always had a interest in figurative art um, and I also very much interested in kind of pop pop art and graphic novels and manga magazines you know the the, the japanese manga the cartoons so I, I always i always i suppose that goes back to the younger days when when i used to love the, the cartoons and the newspapers and uh, copying those i just liked the whole um the figures like you know and little storylines going on in them so then you know, you'd look at people like Norman Rockwell, you know, in America. I just loved his art. Or uh, uh, Jack Vetriano, the um, Scottish-Italian artist. Um, there's always a story going on in, in the paintings. And quite often humor as well. And then when you look at somebody like Burl Cook, she was a, a wonderful British artist. She only took up painting in her 50s, I think, you know, and she had, she used to paint these voluptuous fat women, you know, and they'd be out partying or, you know, having great fun. And there's a kind of co comedy, but observations of life. And I, I always liked that type of storyline. So for me, um, I, I, I wasn't interested in painting a landscape or, or you know, the sea or, or the beautiful sunset or it wasn't really for me. I, I kind of felt there's a lot of, you know, I see that all the outside and I can see it in a lot of people's art. I wanted to kind of create my own little stories going on. And um, yeah, it, it, it kind of, um, that was my, my uh, inspiration, just looking at, at everyday life. So a lot of my art would feature storylines like cafe and bar scenes and musicians. And um, yeah, just people out and about and people observing people, you know, uh, um that that sort of thing so so that was my 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 themes i love to work on and i also loved the bright colors the um vibrant colors and that to me i said you know to use the colors with those themes just kind of gives gives us uh even more uh the, the storyline even more vibrancy uh, you mentioned uh, observation of life in, uh, among some of the things that you sort of admired in other artists. And uh, I wondered how important is observation in the process of your art making? It's important to the extent that you, you need to know what you want to uh, convey uh, in a painting. Um, so ob observing live, I, I, I would love people watching, you know, sitting outside in a coffee shop or whatever, looking at people going by, um, looking at the interactions. So for me, it's important. It probably, I think for every artist or every photographer, or it, you know, or sculptor, it's important because you get your inspiration, you get your ideas from initially from what you see. And then through those, then your imagination then can can take over uh you know like you can then create your own little world from so i think the spark has to come from observing life and other people and i know a lot of artists would carry around a, a notepad and pencil and do the sketches whatever as they go about i was never into doing that i just i would write down maybe little notes you now also taking photographs as well is a great thing you know and then uh you but you might have that notebook or photograph you know, for six months or a year or two years, and then, then you might use it. But for me, uh, and ob observations of magazines, uh, you know, reading magazines and newspapers, 
And I would look at a photograph in a magazine, an advertisement or whatever, and I'd cut it out and say, that would be great now if I had that now. And then, I'd, you know, it'd make kind of a, a jigsaw nearly of different um, images that I would cut out from, you know, uh, mag old magazines. And then I would then start creating my story using those uh, images uh, as a kind of um, uh, as a reference point. What materials do you like to paint with? Uh, oils. I love oils. Uh, I, I just love the whole process. The fact that it takes so long to dry. Uh, I love the fact that you can mix the oils on the canvas as well. You know, uh, you, you don't have to. Uh, in fact, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not big into the acrylics. I find it too, because of it, it dries too fast. I like to change things around. I like the slow process. Um, so oils would be my, my medium to use here. Yeah. Is there like a meditative uh, side to this slow process as well? There is, yeah. Um, I always think, you know, every artist is partaking in art therapy at the same time. You're, you're, you go into a world of your own um, very often and, you know, it could be two o'clock in the morning and you realize, oh my goodness, I didn't expect it to be so late, uh, you know, but you get caught up in this kind of world of your own, uh, you know, and then of course, You'd have some maybe background music on, some, you know, maybe jazz or whatever, some, some music on the background. And it is therapeutic. Art is therapeutic. And I think um, even for people who are not, um, say, skilled in the arts, it, you know, it's for everyone. And quite often we, we, we're, we're told that, gosh, you know, you know, you can't paint, you can't draw. Um, in fact, a lot of people I meet, they say to me, oh, gosh, I, couldn't, I can't even draw a straight line. And I say to them, well, join the club, I can't draw a straight line either. You know, it's not, it's not very easy, but you know, it's creating yourself, you're creating your own imagination on, you know, you know, children, every child has that natural instinct. You give a child a pen and paper and a crayons and put them at the kitchen table or wherever, and they'll just draw naturally and they'll do that. And there's no kind of, you know, child saying to themselves, oh my God, you know, I got the shading wrong here, or gosh, the perspective isn't fully right here, or gosh. you know, they just draw. And um, I think as the older we get, that's drilled out of us that, you know, you're, you're, you're not able to draw, you're not able to, um, you know, whatever. Uh, it's, it's kind of unfortunate, you know, but we all, we all have that childlike desire to create. And unfortunately, a lot of people just lose that. We'll have more of my chat with Franco D. And I take this opportunity to tell you to check out his Dublin Art Gallery's website, balaban.net. That's B A L L A B A N.net. And also to remind you that there are plenty more conversations about the arts currently available FOC free of charge via several media streaming platforms. Now also on Apple Podcasts aka iTunes. I still haven't figured out what the difference between the two is. I probably should. Uh, in addition, of course, to Spotify, Podbean and several others, as well as YouTube. If you're on your laptop, you may want to listen to YouTube instead. But uh, wherever it may be, just search Matt's Art Chat and you should be able to find more of these podcast conversations about the arts, including one with London's Bastian Gallery curator, Chris Craig, here talking about the great Pablo Picasso. He talks as well about being a living legend and having this, having people kind of come pay homage to him and make pilgrimages to his studio. And he was very open to being kind of worshipped as a deity, as it were. To listen to the conversation with Chris Craig and more of my conversations about the arts with creators, curators, experts and art lovers from all over the world, search Matt's Art Chat on most audio and media streaming platforms. You'll also be able to keep track of them on my own personal website, inartemat.com. That's I-N-A-R-T-E-M-A-T-T dot com. And now, back to my chat with artist and Balaban art gallery owner, Franco D. I mean, just uh, that kind of makes me think about the development of one's original style. I mean, is that something that you've always been aware of and concerned with? I mean, just coming up with an original uh, way of making art that was your own. 
Yeah, that that was something I, I kind of was uh, I wanted to achieve. Um, I I know some people like to be recognized for a particular style or particular themes, and because of the artists that I liked growing up, I kind of would have been inspired after and said, well, I, I, I want to do my, my style. It's always, when people say styles now, it's very hard to be totally unique because we're all influenced by other artists and, and styles. But yeah, it was something I wanted to, to do to, to keep that particular um, style. Now, having said that, I've kind of changed a bit, you know, in recent years, in the last, say, five, six, seven years, uh, that I, I've been exploring other mediums and um, other ideas. And so that people, if people saw some of the art I've been doing now, they'd say, gosh, that's not the same person who did, you know, who, who did that, you know. So so th- there's a kind of, I suppose it's a branding in a way, you know, a lot of artists, they, they look at the whole marketing and they want to, you know, to have a brand, to have a name that you walk into a room and instantly recognize their style or whatever. So it, it's probably more so the, um, the, the career uh, artist looking to establish themselves more. They, they want to be recognized instantly. And, and, uh, and then people who say buy, this is kind of going into the, the whole commercial side, but people who buy the art of, of an artist tend to want to buy a painting that is recognizable, that is distinctively by that artist, you know. Right. And that, but uh, with that, uh, of course, comes the risk of sort of being trapped in a style, I guess, too. Yes. Yeah. There, and, and, and certain artists, you're labeled as, well, that's the guy who, who always paints the, the glistering waters or the, the, the sunsets or, or, or the horses or whatever. Um, there, there is, but it's also, that's the artist who became famous or became well known for that particular style. And the artist themselves has to put bread on the table, you know, so they might be able to work on other projects and other, you know, styles, but, but they know that this is the bread and butter and they will continue doing that, you know, so, so it, there's, there's fours and against, you know, the artist's creativity can be, can be, uh, stunted quite often as well. Um, if you think, well, gosh, I'm just going to paint these particular themes or styles because that's what people want. And you be, it, it's kind of like a bit of a manufacturing, you know, a conveyor belt. You just um, roll them off. And that can definitely um, uh, hinder creativity. Right, right. That's that's why, like, s- such artists as, let's say, de Kooning are called uh, <laughs> painters' yeah. painters because they were so unpredictable in their own way, but still yeah. recognizable, but in a way never really confined to a specific style. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting because I, 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 I suppose I have two hats on me. I have my artistic hat and my, my uh, gallery hat, um, art dealer hat. I'm, I'm influenced by, by what other, what people will buy. And I know most artists, you, you know, you, you paint what you want to paint and that's fair enough. But you also need to, if you're trying to make a living out of it, make some sort of, you know, to, to, pay some of the bills, you do need to know what the buyer wants. Now, this sounds very cold and clinical, but uh, I'm, I'm talking now from a, a, a commercial art gallery, you know, owner um, point of view that if, if you don't, if you don't kind of leave yourself um, open to that, you, you can, you can very much then miss out on, um, uh, and, and making it a, a financially successful as an artist, you have to balance the two. The two. Styles. I think so. Yeah, there has to be a balance. You know. Do you feel like there's a there are trends that shape the market? Sometimes I think there is, and then other times I don't. And then sometimes I think, gosh, I have so much to learn. You know, I, I I'm looking at you know, I, well, I had a gallery open for say eleven years, but but prior to that, I would be looking at art. Trends come and go, like fashion, you know, like there's no one uh, dominant trend happening. I, okay, probably one trend I've seen becoming more popular would be the uh, urban art, uh, street art. This is something that I think the younger generation is um, attracted to. And I think uh, partly 
you know, Banksy has a big part to play in that and, and other um, street artists from around that time. But I think Banksy was the one who really brought it to the front, the forefront in, in the art world. And um, the fact that it's so accessible, you know, you don't have to walk into an art gallery. You don't have to feel, you know, a lot of people would feel intimidated maybe walking into an art gallery, a commercial art gallery. But this was done on walls. It was kind of uh, so so different, you know, like the artist wasn't getting paid for it. It was, in fact, it had to be done, you know, uh, illegally very often. And you have these beautiful, I- ingenious creations uh, on the walls and it could have taken days or it could have been done quite quickly, but they were accessible for everyone. And I think um, that that whole trend, um, that has, say, in the last 20, 25 years, has grown a lot. Um, so yeah, you know, urban art, um, uh, graffiti, graffiti, and street art. You know, uh, I, I tend not to use the word graffiti because it tends to give up a, a, a bad name. You know, like uh, you're vandalizing a wall. But um, I, street art, where you have you have artists who actually are pretty good and they're doing these wonderful creations. It, 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 it is a trend that has certainly taken off. Seeing as we started talking about the gallery, uh, I'd love to know more about it. Uh, you, uh, we're talking about the Balaban Art Gallery just off Grafton Street in Dublin. Uh, can you tell me what prompted you to actually uh, to open the gallery? Okay, well, um, I suppose I have to bring you back to um, when I was working in the bank. Uh, at this stage, I was a uh, working full time, uh, expecting a you know a permanent pensionable job in the wonderful world of banking. And then we had the financial crash uh, in Ireland, um, what we called the Celtic Tiger uh, suddenly collapsed um, as it did in the, around the world. But in Ireland, we were particularly hit bad by it. And during these years, the bank had to make severe cutbacks. But prior to that, I had already been you know, very much involved in, in the art. I already had my art dealer uh, hat on but the banks then said uh, my, my employer said that we need people to go and they were offering voluntary severance packages so i was i put my hand up and said me me i, I want to go <laughs> and uh, then i got my uh, severance package uh, now having said that prior prior to to getting that um, i'd already seen this little unit, a little retail unit in the West Bray Mall, just off Grafton Street, and I just fell in love with it immediately. Now, when I say little, it's the size of a matchbox. It, it, it's, it's like um, nine square meters, so it's tiny. But for me, I said, if I can have a little unit, a little shop here, a little gallery here in the heart of Dublin, I'll make it work. Um, the previous owner had been a little jewelry shop, you know, so... For an art gallery, it definitely wasn't practical, you know, so I uh, made inquiries about it and uh, I ended up r- renting the unit while I was still working in the bank. Now, at the time, the banks were giving also uh, six months uh, sabbaticals. So I took that and uh, started working in the gallery and building it up. And uh, then I had to go back to the bank and then I employed somebody to run the gallery while I was back in in uh, the bank. And... Um, for another year, uh, um, then the banks then were offering severance packages, and then that's when I went full time into to work in the gallery shop. So, so the gallery itself, it's it probably a better label would be gallery shop because it it's it's very very small. I mean, it's a huge amount of art, you know, um, little over two thousand artworks. Now, obviously, they're not all fitting in the gallery; most of it's in storage. But the, the gallery, it's, it's a lovely part of Dublin. You've got Grafton Street around the corner, which is um, probably the, the heart of Dublin City. The fact that it's so small, I guess, adds to the character of the place, right? Yeah, it does. It's a, there's a little bit of a, a charm in that. Um, and a lot of the art tends to be um, on display outside. Uh, and look, I'm in a lucky position that in the, the shopping mall, there's a, a roof area um, into the courtyard. So it acts as a protection but there, there is a it's a little bit unique because i don't think there's another art gallery quite like it in ireland um i do meet a lot of tourists coming through and um there's kind of a, a charm that they like about it there's a 
also this uh what do you call it um there's no there's no kind of um fear a lot of people had this fear of walking into art galleries and it's kind of amazing you know even in, and maybe more so in ireland than other countries to have a gallery in ireland you nearly need to you need to be in people's faces nearly like um that they don't have to walk in the door that you don't have to walk up a flight of stairs and you know a lot of the people that say to me i know nothing about art but you know there's nearly like apologizing when you come in the door you know or they're sticking their head in the door you're afraid that you might bite them you know there, there's kind of a i don't know what it is with with the um irish psych but uh People, people feel it nearly intimidated to some degree with art galleries, you know. Um, so this would be more, you know, you have the art there in the window and uh, outside. And I very much encourage um, people rummaging through. Rummaging sounds a, a very kind of, you know, you go to an old antique shop and you rummage through things. That, so to some degree, I have that. And I like people to try and uh, discover something for themselves that they might find a little hidden gem there or a little, a little hidden painting that they've always wanted, you know. So in my little gallery shop, you never know what you'll find. It's absolutely everything and anything. So I, I kind of, I like to see, I, I, that's kind of one of my, I won't call it a mission statement now, but it's one of my um, desires with the, with the gallery shop is to uh, have a bit of everything. Now, to some degree, that is very impractical because if you're working with nine square meters of, of, of space and you're trying to bring in every style and every medium and every theme and every whatever, and you're catering for the tourists coming in, you're catering for the, the locals coming in, you're catering for, you know, people who want landscapes or they want uh, uh, street art or caricatures or whatever it is. It, it's nearly trying to do the impossible, you know, but that's kind of the way I, I operate. I do understand that you, um, in, in response, as opposed to the coronavirus pandemic and uh, all of the challenges, uh, you decided to kind of go online. Uh, can you tell me more about that? I, I, I always had a gallery uh, website uh, when I opened up the art gallery. Um, but I found that this year, because we were in lockdown, um, I needed to... I needed to go basically to more e-commerce uh, so that people could actually uh, buy the art online. So I uh, moved over to the Shopify platform and a friend of mine helped me set that up. And so it, basically my old website would have been just, you know, you show the art and that's it. Now with the, the new website, um, which was a big job now, but I had plenty of time during the lockdown to populate it with all the art. So now you can click and buy and post it out directly and, you know, pay you know, by PayPal or credit card and all of that. So, so it just gives people the opportunity to buy online <clears throat> uh, rather than uh, coming into the gallery. Having said that, a lot of people, and, I, and I, I'd be kind of one of these people, I like to see it in real life before, before I buy it, but it just gives people in, I don't know, in Australia or in America or wherever outside the world, that chance to be able to buy and it's just it's the way we're going. I think all of the uh, the retailers, uh, whether you're an art gallery or any retailer, you need to have uh, e-commerce. You need to have uh, a website where people can purchase directly. You know, what's the name of your website? So the the website <clears throat> it's uh, balabon www dot balabon dot net. That's b a l l a b a n dot net. And uh, so what I'm doing is free wor free worldwide shipping as well. So uh, if somebody goes on, they see something you like, you know, it, it's, it's free anywhere in the world um, to post. And uh, also do deliveries all over Ireland as well. So it's yeah. great. It's important also to support the arts at this time because <laughs> it's very challenging. It is. It certainly is. That is. It's a tough time. And I, I do think, because uh, I, I would know quite a lot of artists, and it's a struggle, particularly uh, that all the art fairs are were cancelled this year and you know galleries are all closed so for individual artists it, it is a, it's a very tough time um but i do believe that the art the art market will pick up again um, i think people particularly during the lockdown people have had more time in their homes and a lot of people have got uh, their house you know, maybe interior designer they've got uh, you know worked on their house and they want to get uh, some new art or whatever so I've actually found that there's more people buying art than 
you know, tr through the website uh, than before. So, you know, they, they kind of people realize, well, I have a bit more money, I'm not going on holidays this year, I'm not going out for a restaurant for a meal, you know, uh, I'll, I'll treat myself to a, a nice painting or a picture, you know, a print or whatever. So, so it's kind of, it's not, you know, it's not all that bad, you know, uh, but having said that, there, it, it's, I recognize the, the struggles and difficulties a lot of artists are going through, but we'll, we'll get through it. All right, Frank, thank you very much for doing this. Thanks very much for taking the time. It's been a pleasure. You're very welcome, Matt. And uh, I'm delighted to be part of this and uh, to meet you and the people of the universe. People of the universe, I hope you liked that one, folks. I certainly did. And again, I remind you to check out Frank's art gallery's website, balaban.net. That's B-A-L-L-A-B-A-N.net. And consider buying some art this Christmas. Help support the arts everywhere, possibly local too. Keep the art economy going in your area, whether you buy your favorite local artist's painting, sculpture or book or music album. It's incredibly important, not only for your part of the world, but for the bigger picture too. I hope you'll join me next week for another podcast conversation about the arts with another creator, curator, expert or art lover from somewhere else in the world. But till the next time, search Matt's Art Chat on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube and several other streaming platforms for more. And don't forget to stay healthy, stay safe, stay strong and I wish you well in your own artistic ventures. <laughs>